So without further ado, I would like to welcome pediatrician, Dr. Daniel Leonard, to share some highlights on the value of vaccines in preventing short-term and long-term illnesses in children. Dr. Leonard, thanks for being here. Yeah, uh, thank you guys. I'm gonna try to do like a week's worth of medical school on pediatric immunology in 10 minutes. So kind of high level stuff here. It's not gonna be too um, vain, I hope. Is that okay. any better? Yep, there we go, perfect. Okay, so we'll go through this um, real quick. So the first tenet of immunology, and I promise you this is all going to be pertinent when we talk about the vaccination, our imm immune system develops in utero. So the first thing we have to do as a newly budding fetus, age four to six weeks, is we have to hide ourselves from our mothers, actually. We're only 50% our mothers. And so there's always this immunologic battle between am I self or am I something different? So if left to our own measures without the sophistication that we have in our immune system, none of us would be here. Our mother's immune system would have destroyed what she recognized as foreign, meaning half of our fathers. So this all starts in utero. Um, and then as we, uh, as we age, we have to learn to differentiate ourselves from any potential foreign pathogens, any invaders. Um, this image is important because I tell my medical students all the time, this little spot here on this newborn's chest X-ray is called the thymus. Uh, it's just above the heart. It's super important because part of the maturation and the academic graduation of our immune system is to send our T cells to school. Um, they're dumped out of a baby's bone marrow and out of their liver, and they literally migrate to the thymus here in the chest where they are told, you are going to be this, you are going to be that. Uh, it's kind of like that little hat deal in Harry Potter and they're assigned to their various dormitories. So this is where maturation of our T cells occurs. Uh, we have a tremendous number of T cells as newborns, children, and younger adults. And they are fantastic at recognizing anything other than yourself. They will kill anything that they don't recognize. They're sort of xenophobic that way. Um, and that's fantastic because kids are seemingly sick all the time. I mean, you have a 18 month old and you've probably been to the pediatrician nine times in those 18 months for all these various head colds and strep or whatever, um, because they have a really great propensity for attacking pathogens quickly and eradicating them quickly. And they do it constantly because they're new to the world. And so things have to be quick, they have to be efficient um, and they get the job done pretty quick. That's fantastic for kids. And we do think that up to this point, it has helped them not be the cohort of the population that is the sickest. Um, and it's been helpful that up to this point, they have not been the greatest carriers or the greatest disseminators of COVID. That is changing. And we're gonna talk about that towards the end here. Um, one thing of note though, I put here in red, uh, by the time you're a teenager or a young adult, you aren't pumping out as many of those T cells anymore. By the time you're our age, 40 or north of 40, you really don't have many at all. They've all been assigned to a disease that you've already come in contact with. That's not to say you can't become immune to new diseases, although that's gonna be in the way of vaccination, which is a different, an entirely different arm of your immune system. There's two systems in the same body. There's something called your innate immunity, which is kill it if it's not you, and there's what's called an, adapt, an adaptive immunity, which is, you've seen this a few times, you may or may not have had a vaccine for it. We're starting to remember that this isn't us, so we're gonna make antibodies to kill it, but we're not gonna have this real fast response. That's why we're, the population needs to be vaccinated because the older we get, the fewer T cells we all have to just knock it right away. So we just talked about uh, children, infants, toddlers having a really robust innate response, uh, but it takes them longer to build up antibodies. When they do, they do such a fabulous job of maintaining immunity because they had such a great, robust response the first time um, that they learn that lesson really quickly and it tends to stick with them longer. But not being able to teach an old dog new tricks is sort of where we are at as adults in our immune response to this. Um, the big kicker here is that neither population, whether it's you guys or kids, had any memory cells for COVID-19. We all got exposed, you know, uh, temporally at the same time, in time to this novel virus. So 
we're all going into this at the same time, but we're all gonna to respond to it differently depending on your age. Kids up to this point have cleared it quicker. They haven't become as sick because that's the innate immune response that they are more equipped with than you and I. A bunch of adults got sick because it takes longer to make antibodies. And when we did, we overdid it. We overreacted. We had these multi-system inflammatory situations. What was a head cold day three became ventilator dependent week three. Um, so that's been, unfortunately, the story, but this is the why behind that. Um, let's see here. We know so much more. You know, a year ago, we promised you guys we're studying COVID. It's a fluid situation. Stick with us. We're learning more every day. We've learned a ton in the last year. Um, we have tons of data, so much data in different cohorts, and we need to make, make meaningful use of it, and we are, but we're doing it in real time while also keeping the world healthier, trying to get healthy. Um, one takeaway point here, though, is that 2019, so this was pre-COVID getting a hold of the world, um, this observation, which is important for other diseases, uh, we noticed that children have a higher naive T cells within uh, tissues throughout their body, not just their blood. And so it didn't matter if they inhaled a virus, if they were in a pool and drank water that had virus in it, they actually had more of a robust uh, propensity for fighting off new diseases better than adults do. And so that was promising and kind of underscored what we were witnessing in the world up to this point. This is a pictograph I uh, found through literature. Um, five clues as to why children have sort of a reduced susceptibility to COVID than adults did up to this point. And, you know, everybody's sort of inhaling COVID, but kids do get a lot of other run-of-the-mill coronaviruses. I had several this summer who uh, had coronavirus, not COVID-19. They did require hospitalization, but they didn't become terribly ill. And we expect this. We expect this every winter. We don't even test for it because it's so common. And there is a chance that some weakly conferred co-immunity to regular coronavirus may be predispose these kids to not getting as sick because they're sick all the time with anything. They're always dialed up in their immune system. Some bigger takeaway points, and we won't get into sort of the PhD level stuff here, but um, kids create different inflammatory chemicals in their body at a less intense degree than adults do. And so they have some protective mechanisms like eosinophils, for example, these cells they are part of your innate immune response. Um, they're not part of your antibody mediated immune response. And we all know the antibodies are the thing that are overreacting and causing people to get crazy sick. Um, and so kids do have uh, protection in this way that in the lung itself anyway, they weren't manifesting as severe disease compared to the adults who just had this incredible what's called interleukin-6, this crazy inflammatory chemical that creates fevers and body aches and edema and fluid to fill your lungs in a sort of self-sabotaging way to clear an infection. It just way overdoes it. And COVID has the ability to sort of turn off your stop switch. It dials you up. It keeps giving you uh, stimulation and it tells your cells that they're not allowed to stop. They're not allowed to turn off and quit being inflammatory. Um, so adult disease progressed really nasty. So that being said, and that being the story up to this point, unfortunately, every other day in my email, whether it's CDC or the AAP or the uh, NHI, there's these little bubbles, these little emails, small studies here, small observations here that kids are becoming increasingly sick and definitely increasingly effective as a disease burdened cohort in population, well, the entire population. And you're starting to see spots, new hot spots of Delta. There are several variants. I care most about Delta because it's most pertinent for the pediatric population. The typical way that this has gone includes uh, COVID binding to an ACE2 receptor. These things line your mouth, your nose, your throat, your lungs. Kids have had, they do have fewer of these binding sites. Um, so like, well, if there's no place for COVID to stick to, they're not going to be as sick and they're not going to be as contagious. And we definitely think we were seeing that. Following binding to ACE2, they enter the cell, they sort of wrap themselves in this 
lipid blankie that hides it from the immune system. They go in, they hijack. Um, your cells are turned into slave labor at that point for COVID. They literally do nothing but turn out COVID virus. Um, and then cell dies. So pretty awful OSHA environment for your cells, unfortunately. Um, the big problem here and the, the new problem that I want you guys to take away from today's meeting and your decision making is that you're dealing with, you're dealing with Delta now. Um, we're seeing northwards of 80 plus percent of new infections in this country are the Delta variant. Well, what does that mean? Like it's, it's not a different color virus. Um, it means that we're changing our affinity for our binding sites and we are hugging, the virus is hugging our cells tighter. In past, if coronavirus, if COVID attached to your cell, it kind of hung out there and waved around like a flag and your immune system would realize, oh, that's different, let's go deal with that. Okay, fine. But the new variant uh, at the binding site is, has three different binding sites. Um, and they're stickier, so to speak, and they are adhering to the cell tighter and sort of hugging those cells tighter. They are therefore, are therefore evading our innate immune responses, unfortunately. And in order to create memory to an infection, you have to, you have to kill a few cells that are infected, which is what kids are really good at doing. But they're not able to do that because they're not recognizing that these cells are infected. It's literally like... Uh, static electricity. I mean, these things are just clinging to these cells and they're not being picked up on by the immune system. Think of it as a molecular camouflage. Um, and so the implication here and the real world fallout of this and the observations we're going to see is that the longer a virus stays in you, uh, the longer it remains subtly infectious, it's going to keep working. It's just not going to be detected as readily by your body, um, which will lead to increased incidences of overwhelming viremia and eventual illness and hospitalization, which we are actually seeing quite the uptick in children at Children's Hospital here in Omaha. You've probably read what's going on in uh, Missouri, Mississippi, and Texas. Same story, relatively the same timeline, definitely the same pathophysiology. So um, to cap on that, <clears throat> the longer a virus is in you going undetected, the higher the chances of a continued error occurring in that virus and thus a mutation. People sort of personify viruses as they, as if they want to mutate, they want to evade our immune system. And that's simply not the case, fortunately, they have no, no conscious to do this. But when you have a huge viral load um, of viruses seemingly doing the same thing, copying the same blueprints over and over and over, an error is going to occur just by law of numbers. If that error, is beneficial to the virus in that it creates a new mutation that now let's say allows the virus to enter a cell in half the time and you're going to end up with twice the viremia it's an error it wasn't an intention of the virus but because the virus had time to replicate the time for error increases you know if i asked <clears throat> two of you to memorize a seven sequence number sequence and then I asked a hundred of you to memorize the exact same sequence and all of you repeat it to me over and over. The chances of an error occurring in the hundred of you is far greater than the chances of an error occurring in the two of you. That is the best way to boil this down. Um, and I'm obviously crazy pro vaccine. I'm, I'm doing clinical trials for Meridian with both Moderna and Pfizer for vaccines in children ages six months and over. Uh, we're well into that research right now, and so I'm, I, I bleed and sweat this just as much as I proselytize about it. Um, and so the big takeaway here is that the Delta variant has been a lot more infectious and a lot more contagious. We estimate it infects nearly three times the number of people per contact that uh, the original strain of COVID did. Um, it's definitely more easily transmitted. And once it is transmitted, it really lays low. It kind of low key hides out in you before um, you feel really sick. So the, as it stands, the majority of our vaccines are thus far effective against the Delta variant. 
it has dropped efficacy from the high 90s to the high 80s. I will tell you that is not vaccine failure. That's actually really fantastic still. Um, we'll accept anything north of 70% when we're trying to fight an infection via vaccine. So I love that we're all shooting for 4.0s here with vaccine, but <clears throat> 3.8 is still okay. Um, so we're still going to push the vaccination because if we can get that number of people, that level of protection, we are going to really thwart the likelihood of these random errors occurring and uh, propagation of new, new variants. Um, and I promise you, breakthrough infections are occurring. They will continue to occur. They make the news. You hear about them. I hear about the ad nauseum, but it is such a tiny, tiny percentage um, of, compared to the actual people who are not having breakthrough infections. And it, it is the only tool we have. It is the only tool we have, short of going back to the dark ages last year of just avoiding each other and becoming <clears throat> introverts. Um, on the heels of that statement, you know, I'm guided and led by the American Academy of Pediatrics. They are my governing body as a pediatrician. And so you will see, you have seen that physicians for the purpose of practicing medicine are going to recommend the kids to an overdue mask because the majority of my patient population doesn't yet have vaccine available to them. So we have to do our best um, while encouraging people who are vaccine eligible uh, to get vaccinated. Uh, so Dr. Um, <clears throat> Oliveria at Yale, and I had previously been at Yale, uh, had commented that last year, you'd have to give a child a really high infectious dose to make them sick. But with the virus as it stands, that's more contagious, even what would be an insignificant exposure now will get them sick and then turn around and infect threefold at the number of people, unfortunately. So I, I feel this way. I feel like Kermit. I feel like school boards feel like Kermit, um, sort of nervous and knowing what you know, but also having to satisfy and deal with probably a, a much larger cohort than I do. Um, you're answering to parents, you're answering to adults, you're answering to each other. I just have to give recommendations and then fix problems as they come up. Uh, but I do want to tell you that you're in a race. Um, the viral evolution that we're seeing versus widespread vaccination. Not every vaccine is 100% effective, but if we drive down the overall infectivity as quickly as possible, we will take potential away from molecular errors, away from the virus propagating itself, um, and reduce the, li the likelihood of um, viable mutations anyway that could take hold in the population again.